What kind of day is it, Craig? Yes, it is a new day, but did you know it's something else? Um, You might be thinking three weeks until Easter, which is true. You might be thinking it's the day I forgot to turn my clock ahead to spring forward, which may or may not also be true. It could be Albert Einstein's birthday, which it actually is. Not that he cares anymore. And um, it is starting really close to the major countdown for baseball season to start, which is April 1st, no foolin'. But it is also National Pie Day. Pie without the E. Mathematical pie. Pie Day was established as a recognized holiday March 14, 2009 and is one of the nerdiest holidays I celebrate. I can't speak for anyone else. Pi represents the relationship between the circumference, the around of the circle, and the diameter, the distance across the circle. Any circle, any size, it could be a penny, it could be a planet, the ratio is the same. If you divide the circumference by the diameter, you're going to end up with the same number. 3.14, that's where we get March 14th for Pi Day, but then it goes on, 15962, and this goes on for infinity. None of the numbers repeat in any any specific pattern that they can uh, find out. Although at 360th rep, 360 appears, you know, that's pretty cool because there's 360 degrees in a circle. Oh, and then I think at the 762nd position, there's six nines in a row. It's called the Feynman point, but doesn't happen at all. And so that makes pi an irrational number. It's used in math and uh, science and engineering a lot. It's often used to stress test a computer. But any equation you use pi in, the value is still the same, it's a constant. So, what do we know about pi? Well, we know it's irrational, it's infinite, it goes on forever, and it's important, and it's a constant. But you're probably wondering, what does this have anything to do with God? Well, that's what I'm going to talk about today. So, last Wednesday night at Sunday School, we did bubble painting. Now, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with bubble painting, but it involves glasses with soap, paint, and water in it, and children with straws blowing into the cup and making bubbles come out and then putting paper on it, and you get these really interesting pictures of all various sizes, circles, little bubbles, little tiny bubbles, big bubbles, And there's one more thing. It makes an an incredible mess, but it's fun. I I do have to admit there was more than once that I said, don't drink it, just blow into it. Well, after we were finished our bubble painting and we were enjoying our snacks, I told the kids, you know, I showed my wedding ring, and I said, in this circle, you know, my wedding ring's a circle, where does it start and where does it end? And they had ideas, you know, like at the top where the diamonds are, maybe it starts there, or maybe at the bottom where, you know, underneath my finger, maybe that's where it starts. And I said, you know, this ring is a circle. You don't know where it starts. You don't know where it ends. It just seems to go on forever. And I said, this is a lot like God. God is here today. God was here yesterday and God will be in all of our tomorrows. And we can take comfort in any uncertainty. There is one constant thing that never goes away or ever changes, and that's God and God's love for us. I'm not sure they made the connection between little tiny bubble circles and God in infinity, but you'll never know. Sometimes I get pretty excited about the weirdest things some people would say. 
I enjoy playing hand and foot. And when my family gets together, or just Brian and I play hand and foot, it involves lots of decks of cards. And at the beginning, everyone takes a stack, and they deal out two piles of 11. And I take way too much excitement when I get just exactly the number of cards I need. I'm like, yay! I feel like we could end the game there because I don't think it's going to get better than that. It gets pretty exciting. Or like when I go to the grocery store or at a store and I decide to pay with cash and I have the exact change, I mean, even if it's four, you know, you requires pennies, even if I have to count out 16 pennies, you know, after I pay, I'm feeling so good, I look around looking for ribbons and confetti, and usually all I see are people behind me just like, really? It took that long. Or sometimes I will read a book and get so involved in the characters that when, as often happens, one of them may die or have a horrible sickness or major tragedy, I will sob uncontrollably and mourn for days. And every now and then, Brian will say, um, it was a fiction book, right? So that didn't happen. Those people were just like made up. And I'm like, you don't understand. Completely irrational. Irrational. Not reasonable, unjustifiable. Pi is an irrational number, like we've already talked about. But I suggest to you, God's love is irrational. It seems unreasonable, and it seems unjustifiable. I'm using the scripture, God's love is irrational. I'm using the scripture, John 3, 16, a very familiar verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. There are over 5 billion people on earth right now, probably some more. How could God know and care about each of us as individuals? Is God like the old woman who lived in a shoe, had so many children, didn't know what to do? There are many things I do not owe, know and I do not understand, but I do know this. Each and every one of us is loved by God. How is that possible when there are so many of us? Well, look at it like a, a person who doesn't know how to read walks into a library. And they walk in and they look around and think, well, that's a lot of books. And you consider the same library with a librarian who works there. The librarian will walk in and knows all the books and knows where they're placed and knows probably when they were written and knows about the authors and other books the authors have written. They might know about the genre of the book and similar authors that write the same kind of book. They might know many things that the experience of the librarian is so much more different. The librarian views the books differently because the librarian knows the books. It's much like the difference between uh, <clears throat> me and my son, Andrew, who's a mechanic, when we pop the hood and look at the engine. Now, I know just enough about how an engine works to cause trouble. I mean, I can add oil and coolant. I can change the oil and check the brake fluid and all of that stuff. But I guarantee you, when I look at the engine, I do not have the same, um, I do not see the engine the same way as Andrew does. He has, sees far more detail and has a far greater understanding. So that's how God knows us. I have to admit, I sometimes think there are people who do not deserve God's love and grace. You know them too. They cut you off in traffic. They laugh that the Vikes do not have a Super Bowl ring every year. No, but seriously, there's people that lie and cheat and they're horrible and they're mean and they do awful things. I have a very clear understanding of someone who is worthy of God's love. Someone stated it this way. If you can start the day without caffeine or pills, 
If you can understand when loved ones are too busy, if you can take criticism and blame without resentment, if you can face the world without lies and deceit, if you can relax without liquor, if you can sleep without the aid of drugs, if you can do all these things, then you're probably the family dog. The fact of the matter is, none of us is worthy of God's love, but it's something that's available to all of us. The loving everyone all the time is not the only irrational thing I think about God's love. Consider for a moment how vast the entire universe is. The current estimate is that our galaxy, the Milky Way, contains about 100 billion stars, many of them in clusters of hundreds of thousands. The Milky Way itself is approximately 600 million billion miles across, and yet it's only a small part of a local cluster made up of about 20 galaxies. There are estimated to be more than 10 billion galaxies filling just what we can see of the universe, let alone what we can't see. National Geographic's publication, The Amazing Universe, tries to bring these dimensions into focus because after so many billions and billions and stuff, you just can't really grasp your head what you're talking about. They said if you were to, uh, re if the scale were reduced a trillion times, so that the sun became the size of a pinhead, then the entire solar system would fit inside a large living room. The nearest star would be 26 miles away. The Milky Way would then become about 600,000 miles in diameter. The Earth itself is only 8,000. This would all be dotted with 100 billion sparkling pinheads when you consider the vastness of creation, why would God love us? Harry Emerson Fosdick answers this question in his book, The Meaning of Prayer. He reminded us that we don't always judge value based on size. While we were still children, we learned that a dime has more value than a nickel, even though the nickel is larger. Um, from my personal experience, I learned this a very difficult way because my brother taught me this lesson which involved pennies and dimes, nickels and pennies, and eventually I was just giving him dimes for quarters at one point. But back to Harry Emerson. He continues, we don't love a baby any less because of its size. If we don't judge value on the basis of size, why should God? We may be a very tiny part of God's creation, but we're far from insignificant. Pi is infinite. We, we went on, we mentioned that, how it goes on and on forever. God is also infinite. Consider Psalm 136, 1 through 3. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. The entire psalm, not just this first part, but the entire psalm has the repeat, for his steadfast love endures forever. This is who God is. His steadfast love endures forever. These are the things God has done. His steadfast love endures forever. This is God is who God is. His steadfast love endures forever. One of the greatest figures in Christianity, Martin Luther, said that even the word God bespeaks of infinite care, infinite kindness, infinite goodness, infinite love. For his grace is greater than our sins, his love is greater than our fear, his power is greater than our impotence, his promise greater than death and the grave. In Revelations 1, chapter, or verse 8, hear what John writes. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The God who is, the God who was, and the God who is to come. 
present, past, and future. You can't cover infinity more than that. Pie, mathematical pie is important. Well, on occasion, dessert pie is important as well. But can you imagine a world without anything circular, without any springs that could be made with the accuracy needed to be functional? Now that it's warming up, I'm asking you golfers out there, can you imagine life without golf balls? It's also invaluable in, co in computations. God is important. God's words are important. God, God's words are important because God's words train us. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. All scriptures, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The words train us, but God's words also direct us. This, God's words direct us. Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God's words can also guide us. They can serve as guides. Romans 15, 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that by the steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So besides training us and directing us and being guides, they also comfort us. God's words comfort us. I think probably most people are familiar with the Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Martin Niemeller was a German pastor who opposed Hitler during the Second World War and spent many days and nights in prison camps, in fact, four years. They stripped him of everything except his Bible. After his release, Pastor Niemeyer gave this testimony. This book and its message meant everything to me during four long years of imprisonment. The word of God was simply my comfort and strength, guidance and hope, master of my days and companion of my nights, the bread that kept me from starvation and the water of life that refreshed my soul. Did you hear that? They could imprison his body, but not his soul or his spirit. They could put him in chains and shackles, but not his dreams and hopes. Right in the presence in some of the most horrific circumstances that have ever happened, this man stayed free and liberated. God's word, right, tr while training us, directing us, guiding us, and comforting us, also gives us hope, because God is a constant source of hope in our lives. With that hope, we know there is an end to the storm. With that hope, we know st strength to call upon. With that hope, we know that whatever we face, it is not alone. With that hope, we know that however horrible today is or yesterday was, there's always a new day. And with that hope, we know peace, we know joy, and we know love. Please pray with me. Loving God, 
Thank you for your irrational love for us. We are grateful for your constant presence in our lives. Help us to understand through your important words how we may love others as you love us. May, be, may it be so forever. Amen. And now, as we do every time, we'll say our New Day Creed together. It's not about me. I give myself freely and totally to God that I may be used for the building of God's kingdom, for the care of God's world, to love God's children, all of God's children, even those who are not like me, even those who do not like me, that God's kingdom might become real and I might be blessed and be made complete.